And seeing that it's two o'clock, let's, let's get going. Uh, good afternoon and, and thanks for joining us for today's Cardiac College Learn Online session. Uh, today, you'll see that we're oriented on, um, uh, on a session devoted to the heart. And we've got some upcoming uh, sessions around heart healthy eating, taking your diabetes medications, uh, and exercise and living with diabetes over the coming days. So the the uh, the the educational suites continue to be exciting and diverse, and hopefully are keeping you entertained and informed. Uh, today's session is about how your heart works, and uh, this is me presenting. It's Paul O. I'm the medical director in the program, and it's always my pleasure to be able to join you for these sessions. Uh, and hopefully we can convey a few concepts that are, will be new to you. Uh, and very importantly, we're looking forward to uh, receiving some questions during and after the, uh, the formal part of the presentation and uh, addressing anything that might be on your mind. Uh, a couple of ground rules, and we always remind you about these things, that uh, these sessions are really geared around education only. Uh, if you have a particular health concern um, that, that, that is um, uh, of importance to you, then we would ask that you uh, connect with your healthcare provider uh, for specific advice about your situation. As we said, we love questions. So if you look at the Zoom platform and look at the bottom menu and look for that Q&A, there, click on it and type in your question at any time. And I will deliberately uh, pause for, for uh, some time at the end of my formal slides, look uh, to that Q&A box, and hopefully there'll be something there from you uh, that we can address today together. Here's uh, the goals and the objectives for today. By the end of the session, uh, you will hopefully know how a healthy heart works thinking about the different systems of blood supply, the electrical system, the valves, the heart as a muscle and a pump. We'll speak about what's what, what a healthy heart looks like, but also what can go wrong with these different systems in the heart, and then touch upon some of the interventions that are used to try to correct these problems. But uh, hopefully this makes a logical sequence of, of uh, information that, that makes really good sense. Um, in trying to get back towards a healthy heart, uh, either through things that you can do or that you and your, your uh, medical team have done together. So what does the heart do in reality? So we'll, uh, I'm sure you've heard before that the heart is described as a muscle in the center left of your chest, about the size of a fist that is responsible for pumping blood you know, 60, 70, 80 times a minute at rest, and it goes faster than that uh, when, when you exercise and will go 25,000 times a day. It's quite remarkable that it has this uh, amazing ability to continue to pump blood around the system. And each heartbeat then sends blood that is filled with oxygen around your body to nourish your muscles and cells and brain and vital organs so that they can all carry out their important functions on a day-to-day -day basis. How does the heart actually work? So in this uh, kind of internal view of the anatomy inside of your chest, the heart is pictured here as, again, that fist size organ to the center and left for the most part. It is surrounded by these kind of pyramidal structures that represent the lungs. And then uh, there are these blood vessels that, that, that go in and out of the heart. The heart is set itself is composed of four different chambers. The upper ones are called atria. There's one on the right side that's called a right atrium. There's one on the left side called a left atrium. And then there are larger chambers down below that are composed of a thick muscle. The, the thicker part of the heart muscle is contained in these ventricles. And once again, not surprisingly, there's one on the right side called the right ventricle and one on the left side called the left ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood into the lungs where the blood picks up oxygen, returns back to the left side of the heart, and then the left ventricle will pump this out through the major blood vessel called the aorta to be distributed all throughout the body. So a lovely circle circuit of a blood flow, picking up oxygen and distributing it around. And these chambers of the heart that need to be uh, nicely uh, 
joined up together and blood flowing in the right ways for everything to work properly. So inside of the heart, or if we think of the heart almost like uh, we, we use the analogy, your heart is like a house. And if you think of how the house is built with the walls and the plumbing and the electrical system and windows and doors and a roof, like that, what makes a lovely, complete house. Um, and, you know, if it's going to withstand wind and rain and storms um, and not have blackouts or, or things like that, then everything needs to fit together very, very well. Well, similarly with the heart, it needs its own kinds of systems to work perfectly well. The blood, uh, the, the heart in itself has its own particular blood supply. Think of that like the plumbing system to feed the heart muscle. It has an electrical system, just like the electrical wires throughout a house. The electrical system of the heart allows for electrical signals to travel along through the heart muscle and then trigger it to beat in a coordinated fashion. So upper chambers go, lower chambers go, upper, lower, upper, lower, atrium, ventricle, atrium, ventricle, heartbeat, 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 heartbeat. So that's the way that things go. Um, and if it's all working well, we've got a nice coordinated pattern. If the electrical system doesn't go quite so well, we get a short circuit, then, then there's gonna be chaos and havoc in how the heart beats. The next thing is that there are valves that separate the different chambers. Think of it like the doors that might separate the, um, the kitchen from the dining room, for instance, or the living room from the den, that if those doors fit very well and they open and close very nicely, they will control traffic. There's no sticking that's going on. That's a nice doorway or window system. Uh, the valves similarly separate the different chambers of the heart from either each other or from the major blood vessels that, that attach to the heart. And then there is the muscle system of the heart. So the heart is one big muscle that, that beats in a nice coordinated fashion. If the heart is strong, the muscles are strong and they can beat and push things out. If the heart becomes weak or damaged, then the muscles don't function very well. Everything needs to work in coordination for the heart to function uh, as strongly as possible. But knowing that these systems are in play, it's possible that we may develop issues along the way as well. We're going to talk about those in a few minutes. Because this is the way that heart disease kind of manifests when we have breakdown in these sorts of systems. So diseases of the blood vessels that supply the heart or the plumbing, this is what we call coronary artery disease, where there is buildup of the plaques inside the arteries and there's blockade or narrowing of the blood flow. We've talked about that before when we describe medicines or other kinds of interventions to open those things up. When there is an abnormality of the electrical system, we may give that the term arrhythmia, Rhythm, rhythm uh, is the, the natural kind of normal coordinated beat, just like it might be in music. A, uh, the, if you see the letter A at the beginning of a word in medical terms, it's a Latin root that means bad or disordered. So disordered rhythm of the heart is a disease of the electrical system. It may be too fast, too slow or very irregular in nature, but some people are living with arrhythmias. And maybe somebody on this uh, session today uh, might be living with an arrhythmia because they are fairly common. Some people have developed sticking of the doors or the windows, just like if you've got a door in your house or a window in your house that is more than 20 years old, then it probably doesn't quite fit in the frame quite so nicely and it may stick upon opening or closing. Well, so too are the valves in our heart. And if you think the valves open and close 25,000 times a day uh, over the course of decades of life, it's not surprising that some of them will develop wear and tear. Some of us are born with slightly abnormal heart valves that may not fit together perfectly, and that increases the likelihood of wear and tear on those valves. Sometimes as we get older, we can build up calcium deposits on some of our valves that make it harder for them to open and close and, and, and juxtapose very nicely. So there are many reasons that we might get into valvular heart problems um, and they can affect our different valves and uh, we will name them accordingly like the aortic valve or the mitral valve as two common sites of problems. Uh, and then diseases, the heart muscle, we might call them collectively 
cardiomyopathies. Again, learning your Latin roots is a bonus in medicine. Cardio refers to the heart and myo refers to muscle and pathy refers to some sort of disease. So cardiomyopathy is a kind of general term for a number of conditions that might affect the heart muscle, either too thick or too thin or, or too weak. Um, a, a clinical term for cardiomyopathies in terms of a description of syndrome might be heart failure, where the heart functioning, the muscle functioning isn't as strong as it could be. So sometimes we refer to that as heart failure. So these are the different categories of heart disease that go along with the abnormalities in the different systems of the heart. And I hope that makes good sense. So let's dive into them in a little bit more detail. Um, so coronary artery disease is a disease of the plumbing. So this cartoon orients us on the heart that sits in the middle to the left side of the chest. If we look at this artery on the surface of the heart, you know, this artery is towards the left-hand side of the heart. It is at the front and it goes from the top to the bottom. So this artery is called the left anterior descending artery. The left front top to bottom, left anterior descending artery. And if we were to look inside of this artery um, at different phases of life in someone who's building up coronary artery disease, then this is what it might look like. Say in our teenage years, these arteries are usually beautifully open. They're a lovely open circle and blood will flow through there uh, with no impediment. You can see that it's stylized as these little red blood cells that can flow freely. In our 20s or 30s, we might start to develop the, uh, the early uh, start of a atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, some people will call this a fatty streak at the beginning. Blood flow is really not slowed down in a big way, but you can see something starting to go on here that doesn't belong. And if you follow this along over the next 20, 10 or 20 years, you can see there's a lot more of a crescent moon that's gone uh, built up here. This is the, the fatty plaque, atherosclerosis, cholesterol and foam cells and macrophages and inflammation cells that have all gone into here. So this is not a happy setting. The uh, opening of this artery has collapsed considerably. This person might experience some symptoms such as angina, particularly when she or he is trying to get up and move around vigorously. You may not get enough blood flow down to this area of the heart muscle. And your heart muscle will say, hey, I'm not getting enough blood flow. Therefore, I'm going to tell you I'm in pain. I've got angina uh, is what might go on there. And then this later stage of the plaque buildup is what we looked at when we talked about heart attacks before, like this area of narrowing could actually rupture. You may actually cause some sluggish flow or actually blockade of blood flow completely. And that's what happens with the with a heart attack. So this is coronary artery disease that is building up. As we said, that if the blood flow really gets um, blocked off completely, uh, that's what this cartoon is trying to show us again in that left anterior descending artery, that if we've had complete loss of blood flow there, nothing gets passed here. There is no oxygen that is delivered down to this further downstream segment of the heart. This area will actually become damaged sometimes reversibly, sometimes permanently. And that's what's really represented of a heart attack. Okay, that's plumbing problems. What about electrical problems? As we said, the heart has this amazing electrical system. You can't really see it if you look at the heart, even if you look at it kind of grossly. Um, but we know from kind of closely investigating the uh, on a, under a microscope what what the what the cells in the heart look like and from electrical mapping work that there appears to be these electrical cables that run throughout the heart system typically the electrical cables start up here high up in the right atrium and this is called the sinoatrial node. The atrium, you see that word atrium there? That means it's in the upper right chamber of the right atrium. Think of this 
like the electrical box that, that kind of sits in your basement of your house or might be in the closet of your condo or apartment where the, the, the main electricity signals are sort of generated from that point. They travel through a few pathways up in the atrium, travel through another major junction box that separates the atrium from the ventricle. So this is called an atrium ventricle node or junction box or atrial ventricular node. Electrical signals pass down there. They're held up there for just a really brief moment. And then they pass down the other main cables down to the left ventricle and to the right ventricle. So when the electricity is working properly, electricity will flow from top to bottom. And you can actually watch this happen when you're recording the electrical signal. And that's what we do with electrocardiograms. Um, when the electrical signals go awry, it can result in different sorts of abnormalities, like the heart may go too slow. Not uncommonly with aging, the electrical system will wear down. Um, if I told you I want to sell you a house uh, that is 60 or 70 or 80 years old, and it had all of its original wiring in the original fuse box in it, you might look at me a little bit suspiciously and say, hmm, um, I'm not so sure that this is going to be a great electrical system. I'm going to anticipate I me might need to do something to this. It might need a new junction box. It might need some new wires. Uh, maybe it's got knob and tube wiring for those of you know, who know home renovation. And indeed, the same sort of thinking could apply to the electrical system of the heart, where these electrical systems can be a little bit old, worn out. So getting slow beats or sometimes even fast beats become more common as we get older. Some people will develop actually segments of the wires that kind of wear out. And particularly at the point of the junction box between the atrium and ventricle, you may actually develop a blockade there. So the electricity is really quite slow. Heart blocks are the reason that people may need to go on and get uh, an external kind of device like a pacemaker. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Some people develop a whole bunch of chaotic signals up top. So not only might you get one electrical signal, but you may get a hundred of them trying to fire off at the same time. Just like, you know, there's a little bit of a short circuit in that electrical box and there's sparks that are flying. Well, for some people, there are sparks that are flying um, out of the atrium. So you can get a whole bunch of different signals that are triggered down the heart um, so it'll go fast and irregular uh, as, as the consequence of that. And, uh, and that may not be so healthy for an individual. And other folks just develop the occasional irregularity or skip beat, meaning that the, 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 the origin of the heartbeat may not be directly from that sinoatrial node, but it may come from elsewhere, like this part of the atrium or this part of the ventricle, where all the cells have the potential to be electrically active and fire things off. If they fire off randomly, then you'll get some irregularity in your heart beats. Okay, turning to the heart valves, what do they do and what can go wrong? Well, as we've said, this is looking like a very familiar picture to you. The heart has these four chambers, atrium, ventricle, atrium, ventricle, and it has these big blood vessels that come out of it. So these valves that are kind of shown in cross section as just kind of two leafy things that are, are meant to hold together. Um, it's almost like a pair of lips. Um, there are valves that separate the right atrium from the right ventricle, and that's called a tricuspid valve. From the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery is called the pulmonic valve. Pulmonic refers to uh, things related to the lungs. So this is a blood vessel that delivers blood to the lungs. Um, in the left side of the heart, the left atrium will send blood to the left ventricle and pass through this here mitral valve. And then the left ventricle will send blood out into the main blood vessel supplying the body through the aortic valve. All right, four chambers, four valves. And normally when blood is flowing, so we're, if we look at left atrium, left ventricle here, so normally when the mitral valve is nicely closed, the atrium fills up with blood 
And then the electrical signal arrives at the left atrium to say, I want you to squeeze now. So when it squeezes, it pushes the blood from the left atrium down to the left ventricle. The valve is open at this point. And once the ventricle is filled, then the valves will close up again and hold really nicely, nice and tight. So it's almost like a lock system for those of you who like to travel in boats on the, uh, through the summer holidays. So fill one chamber, move it on to the next chamber, close it up, and then do it all again. The problems you can imagine that can occur is when these valves don't work pro properly. Um, if we focus, for instance, here on this aortic valve, this is what looks, it looks like normally. When it's open, it looks like there's this nice triangular opening where blood will flow. It's like a big open mouth and away you go. And then when it's closed, it looks like this uh, Mercedes car symbol, right? This kind of triangular shape and all the valves fit nicely together. They're closely uh, posed to one another and there's not gonna be any leakage here. Well, a couple of different problems could happen with this valve. As we said, with aging or wear and tear and damage, that if there is thickening of those leaflets of the valve, the, the valve may just may not um, be able to open in the big mouth that it was like this. So there's going to be restriction of the blood flow as it tries to uh, leave the left ventricle and get into the aorta. So there is narrowing or stenosis of that valve. And when it's closed, it closes reasonably well, but it's kind of stuck in a way. So that is stenosis. The valve is stuck closed and does, doesn't open because it is oh, abnormally thick. Another kind of valve problem is shown in this uh, picture here of the mitral valve. There's the left atrium up top. This is the left ventricle. This uh, mitral valve is held in place by these little uh, tendrils here. Um, and normally this is held uh, nicely uh, together and closely opposed. In this picture here in the lower right uh, hand of this illustration, you'll see that these valves don't fit together particularly nicely. And that reddish jet that we're seeing here represents what happens if the valves don't close properly when this big left ventricle squeezes shut or squeezes to push the blood out in this direction, it will also push blood backwards. And this is called regurgitation. Regurgitation, uh, you know, you can think of that as vomiting. Uh, that's where we use that word before. So things coming back up out of the stomach. Well, here, regurgitation refers to blood flow that's going in the backwards direction as well. So the, clearly this is not nice. You don't get enough blood flow going in the direction that you want it to. And it's going to stress out and stretch this upper chamber as well. So both of these are not good scenarios of either stenosis or regurgitation. And you may then need to see your cardiologist and or cardiac surgeon to deal with these sorts of problems. Okay, turning on to those pump problems now, cardiomyopathy. Uh, again, we might start with the scenario of the heart attack that's familiar to us, where we had a problem of that left anterior descending artery. We seem to keep beating up on it. Uh, if you've developed a blockage of that artery, you've starved the downstream muscle from any good blood flow and oxygen, and that muscle may actually die off. If that happens over time, uh, this normal heart, and particularly if you focus on this left ventricle, that is normally nice and streamlined and cone-shaped, may become stretched out and baggy over time. Heart attacks may cause this if there's enough damage to that muscle wall. Other things that cause the heart to stretch over time, like high blood pressure that is unchecked for a long period of time, or certain viral infections of the heart, the damage to heart muscle may cause this sort of thing. So big baggy heart doesn't beat very well, doesn't push the blood along, can make you feel kind of tired out. Okay. Those are the conditions that affect plumbing, electricity, valves, muscle. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, in a previous session, we talked about this plaque. And when it goes bad, there are approaches to try to fix the plaque part and the thrombus part. And we've talked about those, those different things in terms of medication approaches. 
um, we talked about the importance of lifestyle approaches, right? And um, the reason that we have cardiac rehabilitation, the reason that we have educational programs for all of you, like the cardiac college, is that we believe that um, taking control of all of these five major pillars is critically important. And it starts with understanding of condition. That's the purpose of today's education. But getting active and eating healthy and feeling well and taking control of your health are all critically important. Um, the medications, as we said, play an important role in uh, kind of uh, addressing coronary artery disease attributes. And that's the role for these various medications that we've talked about before aspirin and other antiplatelet drugs to address the thrombus, beta blockers to relax the whole heart system, statin drugs and other cholesterol lowering agents to reduce the amount of cholesterol here and stabilize it, uh, blood pressure agents like the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers to try to stabilize, smooth out these arteries, lower blood pressure, reduce the stress in the walls. These are all really good approaches. But in addition to that, we also have some kind of interventional things that we can do or procedures. And uh, some of you uh, who are participating in cardiac rehab programs may have gone through a procedure like this called a percutaneous coronary intervention or its other name, a coronary angioplasty. Um, so if we think coronary, that must mean we're getting to the circulation, the blood vessels in the heart. Angio is the blood vessel and plasty means we're going to do something to change the shape of that blood vessel. And you'll recognize that uh, at the time of an angiogram and angioplasty, that a catheter is inserted either into the groin and threaded up the big blood vessels or into the arm uh, and through the blood vessels to the heart. And then the catheter is brought around to the place in the artery, once again, left anterior descending. It's not the only one that gets affected, but it's the one that we often draw cartoons about. So if the area of narrowing is occurring down here at this level of the artery, uh, there's the narrowing, there's the wire from the angioplasty, there is the balloon that's been inflated to compress um, that narrowing from the inside out so that the opening of the artery improves, then that is what an angioplasty coronary intervention looks like. And if you want to actually watch a very nice animation about this, uh, we would uh, suggest that you go to the American Heart Association and uh, look uh, to some of their educational videos, which are just terrific. And here you can see this picture, very nice picture of a balloon being inflated inside the artery. And then most often after the balloon opens up the artery, another balloon with this metal stent is inserted and then the stent is left behind to maintain that blood flow afterwards. Another approach that some people undergo, if there is an area of blockage, then it's possible, in, in, and if one can't open that up internally with a wire and a balloon and a stent, is to actually just bypass that segment of narrowing. And here, again, for orientation, there's the heart, there's the artery on the right side of the heart called the right coronary artery. And here you're seeing that there's a bypass vessel that's being put into place that takes blood from the aorta through this piece of vein graft or artery graft down past the blockage. So now this segment of the heart muscle is being fed from a new channel of blood flow, which is very nice. Um, and then this uh, diagram shows the, the kind of the modern ways of doing bypass operations that may include this vein graft, as well as an internal mammary graft that's bypassed these two different second sections of blockage in the coronary arteries. Those are plumbing problems and how we might deal with them. With the electrical problems, we alluded to the notion that if there is a short circuit, if there is a blockage in the electrical channels of the heart, then we may need to get around them in some fashion. And that's where, where a pacemaker comes in. Think of a pacemaker as a device uh, about the size of, um, uh, of a Timbit. How's that? I used to say cigarette lighter, but we don't use cigarette lighters of course, anymore. So uh, it, it's a small device uh, that will sit up in the, usually the left side of the chest, maybe the right side of the chest, just under the collarbone. 
Um, it is a battery and a mini computer that connects with wires that are thread through the blood vessels just under the collarbone. That's called the subclavian vein uh, down to a section of the heart. And so it's actually sitting inside the chamber of the heart and the tip of the wire typically sits at the, at the tip of the right ventricle. Sometimes there's a second wire that sits in the right atrium as well. These wires are called leads that will detect all the electrical signals that happen in the heart right now from the internal or native electrical signals. And what uh, the, the signals are picked up by the wires sent back to the computer and the computer says, okay, that looks okay. It looks like there's enough internal signals that are going through that I don't have to do anything. I just have to be on standby. But if um, the, the, the pace of the electrical signals inside the heart are too slow, then this pacemaker, this computer and battery are gonna take over and now start to drive the electrical signals uh, for this heart where the electrical system is kind of broken. So here, if we look at a new electrocardiogram for this person, you will see that there is this little sharp spike that corresponds to this red arrow, followed by an electrical activation, sharp spike, electrical activation, sharp spike, electrical activation. So I think you get the pattern. And when um, your healthcare provider sees this on an electrocardiogram, they'll recognize this really sharp spike here, that does not look like a natural phenomenon. This is something that can only come from an electrical device like a pacemaker. So they'll look at the, the pattern and the frequency of these electrical spikes and make sure that there's one of these things uh, that, that follows every pacemaker spike. And they'll say, look, it looks like the pacemaker is driving this rhythm 100% of the time and it looks like that there is very reliable capture of this. So your pacemaker is working quite fine um, in that way. Some people have a fancier version of an electrical device called an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, meaning that some people that have a propensity not only to slow beats, but also to dangerous fast heartbeats may need an even smarter system here that can read those dangerous fast kinds of heart rhythms. So this kind of rhythm is a very bizarre, um, irregular, doesn't look coordinated at all. This is a rhythm that's called ventricular fibrillation. And in fact, this is what happens when the heart it's on its way to stopping completely. Um, so this is very dangerous. If you were in hospital and we saw this going on, then uh, the emergency team would run to your bedside and apply the electrical paddles and shock you. Well, some people have this happening without, um, without kind of warning, and it might happen over and over again. So the remedy for that is to put in one of these um, smarter computers called an ICD that can read these electrical rhythms from those leads or wires. And if it detects that something like that is going on, it can actually deliver its own big shock. That's what's shown here as this large black uh, thick line here. And it kind of does a reset on the heart by delivering the shock. And you'll see that afterwards, it can reset your heart and restart it with this nice, normal, regular rhythm here. So this is the, the, the excitement of using an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Some people get this because they've had experienced this very dangerous heart rhythm in the past, or that there might be concern because there's been damage to the heart that this may come on. So some people are getting these as protection or prophylaxis against these dangerous heart rhythms. Okay, moving on to the valve story. Um, so we have gone through a discussion where the valves may undergo significant narrowing. Um, and there's two ways of approaching um, uh, getting a, a replacement for that kind of valve. Um, and this is the more modern approach that is being used for many people these days so that one can 
thread a bigger wire now uh, up to the heart. This is bigger than we might use for an angiogram. It's got a big balloon on it, and it also can have a valve uh, on it that, that's kind of compressed. And once it goes right into place, say at the level of the aortic valve, the balloon can be inflated. And then one, what is left is this nice valve uh, in behind to replace the valve, like the aortic valve, using a transcatheter route. So this is a nice approach to um, putting in a more functional door or window in the place of a valve that wasn't working so well before. Uh, there are, of course, surgical approaches that have been used for decades uh, to replace these valves as well. And this is still being done for many uh, people um, in, in this day and age. And the choice of whether one will replace the valve completely using a surgical approach or this catheter approach depends on factors like what the valve looks like, how old you might be, what else is going on with your condition. Um, and between the cardiologist and the surgeon, they'll make the best choice for you to get you a functioning valve. The outcomes from both procedures are extremely good and certainly put you in a better position than before when these valves were, were stenotic and not looking very nice. Okay, one last thing. Uh, deals with muscle problems. And this may apply to some folks as well. Coming back to if the heart muscle is not working so well, then we need to help out this heart in different ways. One thing that we can do is try to reduce the stress um, on the heart itself. We can do it by using medicines to slow down the heart. If the heart's stressed and is struggling to keep up, well, let's slow it down. And that's the idea of using beta blockers or the Olol drugs to allow better coordination of the heart beating. We can reduce the stress and resistance in these big blood vessels throughout the heart. And that's where these kinds of drugs like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers that we talked about already to protect the heart, they can protect um, the blood vessels and can protect the system when um, the muscle isn't working so well. And we might also use diuretics or water pills to take away some of the extra fluid in our system so that uh, we're not overloaded and, and stressed out in that way. And from the procedural perspective, some people are actually getting uh, additional mechanical help for their hearts that may not be functioning so well. Uh, so there are um, a few people uh, with advanced heart problems or heart dysfunction or heart failure in whom a pump is actually inserted through the tip of the heart. And then this pump now will take over the function of what the muscle used to do. Now, this is going to be um, consuming a lot of energy um, and is going to be somewhat complex machinery. So this pump is typically connected through uh, some important wiring through an external battery system. Um, and, uh, you know, typically people will wear at least two batteries to keep this system functioning at all times. Um, but that can be really important. So we have gone through a long conversation today about the, the normal aspects of the heart, uh, from the plumbing, through the electrical system, through the valves, through the pump. We've talked about what's um, kind of the normal aspects of functioning through to things that can go wrong uh, with the functioning, and then talked about some of the interventions that are in our power from lifestyle through to things that we might do with medication approaches to surgical interventions. Um, the story is that uh, we can address many of the issues that ail us uh, that are associated with heart problems that accumulate over time. So now is your time, if, if you'll indulge me, and ask any questions uh, that you might have. Um, I'm hoping that there's something that, that, that you might want to pose. But I would also understand, given the amount of time we've already put into this session, uh, maybe you've heard enough. And, and there are, of course, some great resources on the Cardiac College website as well. So is there anything on your minds that you'd like to pose?
Okay, while you still may be thinking of this, I'm just going to move on and, and uh, deliver a couple more announcements. Um, one, one very important one for those of you who are social media savvy and connected that uh, our um, educational platform called Health E University that includes our cardiac college resources and diabetes college resources uh, are now not only available on the web, they're also on social media. Uh, so there is a Twitter handle for the Healthy University. And uh, we'd ask you, uh, if you're on Twitter, to follow us at, at healthEU underscore TRI. So thanks for doing that. I'm looking at uh, the question box and one of our colleagues is asking, is a slow heart a problem? And the answer is um, maybe. Um, so some people have slowish heart um, rates. Um, normally the heart rate we say physiologic normal is between 60 and 100. Some people are closer to 60, or, uh, 60. some people are closer to 100 and all of that can be quite fine. Because many people in the cardiac rehab programs may be on medicines like beta blockers, we would expect your heart rates to be slower. So at rest, they may be 60 or even 50, and that can be quite fine as long as you are feeling well. That is, if you are up and around and not feeling dizzy, you're able to do your walks or other kinds of rehab activities and you have good energy, that is not a problem. Some people though, if your heart rates are slipping down below 50, now you're getting to 40s. Well, that might be the edge of a problem by itself. Uh, uh, and it's also more of a worrisome thing if your slow heartbeat of 40 or slower is coupled with episodes where you're feeling like you're faint or you may pass out. That might be a signal that there may be worse kinds of underlying problems like the heart blocks or dangerously slow heart rhythms where a consideration for a pacemaker might be in order um, and or an adjustment in medication. So if we saw you and your heartbeat was 40 and you're feeling dizzy at times and you're on a large dose of a beta blocker medicine, then you and your doctor may say, well, let's take a little bit less of that medicine and see how things are. Um, if you are having a heartbeat of 40 and you're very slow and dizzy and you're not taking any medications, then you and your doctor may set you up for a tape recording of the heart rhythm called a Holter monitor. If a very slow rhythm or blocks and pauses in your heartbeat are observed, then that's when a consideration for a pacemaker may be entertained. Okay, great. Well, thanks for posing that question. And I I hope that answer was 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 uh, adequate. Um, okay, I don't see anything else at this point, so let me just move on and and uh, close out this session. Uh, I will inform you that on Thursday this week, uh, there's a great session that will be offered by our dietitians, uh, and the topic will be how to choose heart healthy foods. I hope many of you will be able to join in on Thursday, February the 18th, uh, and of course. Uh, we have an online community that are, are, are watching these sessions asynchronously. So after uh, and you're not joining us live, uh, we're glad that you can join in and, and watch these uh, episodes. It's our pleasure to bring them uh, to you. So um, with that, uh, thanks for joining. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to connecting again soon. Uh, wishing you a wonderful day. Take care.